recorded in the beautiful mountains of British Columbia. Welcome to Friends, Friends on, on Horses. Horses. <laughs> Welcome back to Friends on Horses. Today we have a unique podcast focusing on efforts a group of innovative equestrians have pulled together to support those impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Jess Clausen is an event writer, freelance writer, and activist who lives in Northwestern Virginia. They are a freelance writer for equestrian and mainstream publications with a PhD in education and history. They focus their equestrian life on off-track thoroughbreds, eventing, and the United States Pony Club, of which they are a proud Horsemaster member. They live in the hayloft over the barn with two dogs and three cats and spend their days mucking out, writing, and wondering just how long that piece of hay has been in their hair. Today we are excited to speak to Jess about the Online Riders Collective and Clinics for a Cause, among many other topics. Welcome to the podcast, Jess. Hi, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Uh, I wanted to just jump right in and uh, ask you a bit about your horse journey and how you kind of found horses and uh, ended up sticking with horses. Yeah. So I was definitely that kid that was like born being like, where's my pony? Oh, you can see my cat. That's Hermione. Oh, hi, Hermione. <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> she did not plan on being on video today, apparently. Um, yeah, I, I was born like, pony, where's my pony? Like the very first conversation I remember, the first memory I have at all is of me telling my dad the list of names that I had come up with for a pony. And I, my mom thinks I was about two and a half or three at that point. <laughs> so I was just ponies, ponies, ponies. Fortunately, my mom is also a horse lover. She grew up like kind of poor in Florida. She didn't have a lot of opportunity, but she took whatever she could to just get on a horse here and there. So when I came along and I was like, let's do it. She's like, all right. So my mom and I kind of started taking lessons together when I was four at just, you know, a little lesson barns in Indiana. This was the early 80s. I think the horse scene was a lot different then. You didn't have to be like rich really to start taking lessons the way I kind of feel like you do now if you want to be you know competitive at all so we just sort of found ourselves in an eventing barn and that's what we've stuck with ever since I also really love dressage so we didn't have a ton of money you know growing up but my mom and I would just both really liked working hard so we'd buy green horses and retrain them and sometimes sell them sometimes not and it's just been super fun. It's been a fun thing to do together. I got in a pony club early, which was great because that gave me a really solid foundation for, you know, being able to be a lot more independent. Now I basically run my own barn. Um, it's just me and my mom's horses. We don't have like borders or anything because I just don't have the patience. But <laughs> it, you know, that pony club foundation has allowed me to be competent in taking care of six or seven horses, you know, on my own, make the decisions, schedule the appointments as necessary and all of that. And I've just, I think I've been actually really lucky that instead of growing up having um, always had like kind of the nicest, easiest horses to ride, I've sort of always had tough ones. And that's given me a lot of, I don't know, determination. I, I like riding the tough greenies. I love getting thoroughbreds off the track and retraining them. So that's a little bit my journey. It's, you know, it, it's not atypical, I think. I think a lot of people have had similarly wonderful educational experiences, and I'm really glad about that. That's, that's awesome. Um, the, I'm curious about the off-the-track thoroughbreds, and uh, you had mentioned that to us in kind of our online conversations before. Yeah. Uh, what is it that appeals to you? Obviously, you said some challenges, like you, you enjoy a bit of a challenge. Yeah. Um, is yeah. there something out there for you? Yeah, well, I'm an event rider, and so I like a horse with a lot of blood that's going to get around cross-country and make the time. Um, you know, I don't want to go advanced or anything because it's too scary for me, but, you know, preliminary, I don't know if you have the same, like, eventing levels as we do. I know it's different in England, but, you know, I, I just, I think the thoroughbreds have the capacity I want for all three phases of eventing, and I never have to feel like, oh god, how are we going to get this horse fit enough to get around, you know, this cross-country course. So I like that element. Um, I'm also really lazy, and I don't like kicking and whipping and whipping and kicking to make a horse go. Like, that will drive me bananas right from the start. So I like the thoroughbreds that have a little go in them, because I do so much better. Um, I had a coach once that said I could put an orangutan to sleep. Like, I just do better taking a really hot horse and, like, bringing it down a level 
I have nothing in me that can create energy from a horse that doesn't have it. It just does not exist in my wheelhouse. So thoroughbreds and, you know, the sort of hotter types are, are my preferred ride for that reason. Um, it's really fun hearing you talk about Pony Club, which isn't something that we've really touched on in the podcast yeah. to date. Um, a lot of our listeners know that Emma and I actually met at Pony Club when we were um, yeah. about 12 years old. And nice. so it was really kind of a fun starting point um, for our friendship and many, many years of just super fun camps and going to horse shows yeah. together in clinics and I remember, you know, growing up in a relatively rural area, there weren't a lot of other kids that um, were into horses. And then, you know, discovering Pony Club, it was like, there's other kids out yeah. there that also like horses. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. And it was it just a really wonderful way to continue in the horse world and in that learning. Um, you are a horse master, um, which both mm -hmm. Emma and I were chuckling about because I, I don't think we have that here in Canada. I'm wondering. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. I've, I've never heard of it either. And I'm like, oh, this sounds like, <laughs> like, like a, some kind of, like a high level gangster or, or <laughs> rapper or <laughs> what does this mean? What is this thing? What is the horse master? <laughs> Right. It sounds, I, I, I kind of don't love the name because I'm like, well, it's just, but you're, you, can, you also kind of can't call it adult pony club. Like that also sounds wrong. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> but I love the concept. I love that now basically there's no age limit in pony club anymore, at least in the U S pony clubs. Mm -hmm. So that you, you just stay in it forever as far as, you know, for as long as you want to, and you can, it, when they were piloting the horse master program, I think you could only go through a certain rating, like maybe like C2. I don't think they were doing it for the national ratings, but now you can do everything everybody else can do. You can rally and, you know, if you want to, I wouldn't probably because it seems like that's a special time for kids, you know, to be sort of free of adults and have a good time at a horse show without adults breathing down their neck. Mm -hmm. um, but you can definitely get all of your ratings that you want to. Um, Somewhere in the back of my head, I have a goal that's been simmering that I'm going to get all three of my A ratings in eventing, dressage, and show jumping, but yeah. we'll see. <laughs> Not I yet. Wish, Not this year. <laughs> I wish that Pony Club here continued on. Like such a, I know that um, at least I've talked to people in our little kind of rural community about we, we're always chasing those days because the feeling of community and the yeah. activities you're doing together, you know, it's like you, you miss that, but uh, you still have that. Yeah, I do still have it. I'm very lucky. I'm also lucky that my local pony club meets at my farm, so I don't even have to trail or anywhere most of the time. It's just like, this could not be a better setup for me. Um, and I, I know exactly what you mean. I think when I look back on my childhood riding, the best time I had, the most fun I had was definitely doing pony club stuff and just going to rallies and having camp. And I just don't remember ever having more fun on horses than that. So I want more people to join Pony Club. That's like a not secret mission that I have. And, you know, kids and adults alike. My mom is a horse master member too. She got her D3 last year, which I was very proud of her for. And she wants to get her C1 this year. We'll see what, um, is allowed, you know, if Pony Club, Pony Club is not letting people do certifications right now. And like, technically I could do her C1. They probably won't let me because I'm her daughter, but you know, it would be fun. It's, it's cool to see her like get ready and prepare and study and stuff like I did when I was a kid. So. And is there like a mentorship component too? Like having just those adults still involved in Pony Club? Ideally. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, club to club, that's going to be different. But a lot of the adults I know who are members are also volunteers in some way or another. I was the Virginia Region Horse Management Organizer for a year to kind of do my time and help out. And we have um, one of my good friends who's a horse master member in Maryland is also a chief horse management judge. So she gets paid to come to rallies and you know be sort of the guiding overall judge for the whole thing, which is great. And it's a really great way to give back. And that's a cool thing to do too for, you know, adults who have been through Pony Club, whether you're a member now or not, that's another really good way to get involved. Um, so she 
serves as a mentor all the time. But I think there are some adults in Pony Club who don't, who are beginners themselves, who might, you know, need mentoring from the younger members. And I see a lot of that happening too. You know, I see kids who grew up on the back of horses helping someone who's 40 and got on a horse for the first time last year kind of figure out like, you know, how to reassemble the bridle or going through the parts of the horse together. So the mentorship thing definitely works both ways. And I think that's really great. The mentorship um, and the learning that you touched on are two kind of, at least from my experience, big parts of Pony Club. But for people who don't understand what Pony Club is, what the levels are, what the things are that uh, we actually learn about in Pony Club, would you mind um, expanding on that? Sure. So Pony Club is built around a certification system. We used to call them ratings and sometimes I'll slip and call it a rating, but now we call it a certification. Mm -hmm. And so we have, there are sort of three groups of certifications. There's the D's, D1, D2, and D3, and that's your very beginner rider. A kid will come in at the D1, they should be able to um, walk and trot by themselves, walk over a pole on the ground, I can't even remember if they need to canter. They might not, mm -hmm. um, but they should probably be about ready to canter. I'd have to look up the standards to be sure. So, and then D2, like they're definitely cantering. They're cantering over poles. You know, D3, they're ready to go do a little event where, you know, jumping like 18 inches, they need to be able to go through a little, little tiny grid, jump little tiny fences at the trot and the canter. Um, and be able to ride out of the ring safely. So the D ratings are kind of just getting you started with the foundations of horsemanship. And it's not just the riding. For all of these certifications, there's a knowledge component that is commensurate with the riding level. So for the D1s, you need to be able to tell me like what, how do you use a hoof pick? Or name five parts of the pony and name two things ponies eat, like that kind of thing. Horse management, knowledge, book learning stuff. And so that progresses and comes complexity along with the writing, which I think they've done a wonderful job of marrying the book learning stuff with the writing stuff to make sure it all is consistent. Because you know, if you've got a seven-year-old kid who wants to do their D1, they're not going to be able to go into detail about how a horse's digestive system works, for instance. But they can probably name five parts of the pony, the eye, the nose, the tail, right? That sort of thing. Then you get into the C ratings, the C1, so in, a, in tradition, on the traditional track, which is the eventing track, that's like you're ready to go beginner novice. So you're jumping around like two six, you should be able to do a little dressage test and you're, you should be starting to expand your knowledge base. C2, you're stepping it up another level, C3. By the time you're at the C3, that's the first national level rating. So the D and the D ratings on the C1 are all in the club level. The club handles it. You just you know, you don't have to like travel far. You're probably not dealing with a stranger. It's all supposed to be pretty low key and unintimidating. The C2 is regional and then the C3 is national. C3 and up are all national. So then it gets a little more intense because you're, you're likely devoting two or three days to a certification. You might even have to bring more than one horse if the horse that you, you know, if you have a horse that's really, really great on the flat and not so great over fences, but you don't have a horse that does both. Um, and at the national ratings, you also have to be able to ride to catch ride. So both on the flat and in the show jumping phase on the traditional track, you need to switch horses. And the, um, the oh my gosh, the certifiers, what are they called? The National examiners. There we go. The <laughs> national examiners are pretty conscientious about who they're putting on one, what horse, but that can be intimidating for a lot of people. So you can ride your own horse great if you show up with a horse that's like perfect in every way, but this is kind of what makes it different from the horse show, right? For At a horse show, you can get away with a lot if your horse is making up for it for you, but not at Pony Club. You actually have to be able to get on a new horse, figure it out, and ride it. And so the complexity of what you have to do on that catch ride, again, increases with the level. By the time you get to the very, very top, which is the A, we consider that someone who, in whatever track you're on, whether it's eventing, show jumping, or dressage, we consider that you're ready to begin your professional career. You're, it's like the jumping off point into, you know, starting your first program, maybe. So we, they actually separated out the knowledge component from that because the A is such a big writing test. You have to pass a whole knowledge piece called the HA, 
which in itself is a rating that takes about three days. And then after you've passed that, you can register for your A. Um, it's an outstanding experience to be part of an A certification. You see people have been working for a long, long time to get to that point. They've worked very, very hard. They've ridden a lot of different horses. They've had to have been out there competing in whichever of the three sports it is that they're doing. And there's nothing as exciting as being there when somebody passes that A and gets to, you know, they've done it. They've gotten to the top. And it's it's a goal to strive for. It really is. Um, I think for the for the eventing track, it's about intermediate level. Um, they kind of want to make sure, like if they send you out intermediate, that you're not going to die. I think dressage, it's third or fourth level. And then show jumping, I'm so bad at meters, but I think it's about four foot three is about what you need to be able to jump on your own horse and on someone else's. Oh. So it's tough. It's hard to get there, but people do it. It's It's really astonishing to watch. And I'm always so proud when I run across somebody in the Com competition world, regardless of what discipline they're in, who's a pony club graduate, especially if they're an A graduate, a lot of times you'll see they'll have a pony club pin on their jacket lapel. And that always makes me really happy. That's, that's so cool. And it sounds a little bit more badass than our experience. Hey, Mira? <laughs> our experience was a lot of camping and tents and, and outside clinicians and... <laughs> setting up little jumping courses and all, you know, try to figure out how to jump over things. <laughs> yeah, but that's what it's all about. I mean, if you're not doing that, you can't go, you know, you can't do anything else. And if it's not fun, there's really no point. So yeah, no, it's probably more similar than we realize. Mm -hmm. the, the, yeah, the fun, the fun component we really had down, I, I would say yep. over here. Yes. Yeah. Um, one thing that I like to tell people, especially when I'm talking to parents and they're wondering about getting their kids into Pony Club, is I like to bring up that it really is a well-rounded program, and you spoke to that beautifully. You know, as the kids are moving up through the levels, um, there's the riding component, but then there's also like the stable management component, learning how to take mm -hmm. care of your horse and your tack, and they're really building skills. And I remember, like, I'd sit down with my pony club manual and study for hours and drive my mom crazy quoting mm -hmm. stable management stuff. But it really gives yeah. you a foundation for being a horse person, right? Yeah, I think that I'm, I don't know if it's because of the sort of, community I'm in or the horse community that I am most familiar with these days. Um, but I feel like I'm seeing less and less of kids learning, and, and adult amateurs for that matter, learning that stuff, unless they're specifically doing it through Pony Club. You know, before I joined Pony Club, the first barn that I started out in didn't have a Pony Club, but I was still expected to get to the barn as early as I needed to, to get my pony tacked up. I was expected to completely cool out and care for my pony after the lesson. I needed to clean all of my own tack. And I mean, we're talking when I was four or five. If I needed help from an adult, I could get it, but it was my responsibility to get it done. And I'm, you know, I, I wish that was everybody's experience. I, I think there are a lot of reasons now, at least, um, I have a lot, a lot of friends in the hunter jumper world who tell me that that is just, impossible to find now at any kind of barn that goes to the horse shows. They just do not do that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why. I don't know if it's because people don't have time and they want to show up and they want to take their one hour lesson and then leave. They got to go to the next thing. Or if the barns are worried about having kids just sort of <laughs> running around on the loose, which is probably how the three of us all grew up <laughs> or what. But, you know, I've been worried about the next generation of, you know, of horse people of equestrians coming up that just like what are they going to do when there's nobody left to tell them what to do you know so and my I was talking to my equine vet the other day and he was saying that they are having a hard time recruiting people to go into equine veterinary medicine because he thinks a lot of kids didn't grow up doing all of the horse care themselves you know I could put on any kind of wrap you needed on a horse by the time I was 15, I was completely comfortable doing that. And he's like, I have a hard time finding anybody that will wrap their own horse now, wow. which just is such a head scratcher for me. But he said, if you haven't grown up, you know, doing all the ins and outs of horse care, including managing injuries and illness, then, you know, it just, 
might not appeal to you and you haven't stood there and held your own horse for the vet, you know, that's all stuff that I think is getting lost at least, at least in the world that I am seeing. And that bums me out a lot. So whatever we can do to get people into learning the horsemanship components of it and not just being outstanding riders, I will do that, whatever it takes. <laughs> it's such an intimate relationship that you form with your horse when you're part of all of those experiences. Just, you know, mm -hmm. I think back to um, one of our pony club exams. I don't know if you remember this, Emma, but we had to, we had three horses side by side and with your eyes closed, you had to be able to tell by feel which leg was mm. your leg and I remember wow. that, like so vividly because it's still something that I do yeah. like with my horses today is I'm always feeling their legs because if there's anything mm -hmm. wrong if there's any swelling heat if there's a little you know a little fly bite that I didn't know about the day before I'm gonna mm -hmm. feel it because I know them inside and out and it just it really just the intimacy piece that you develop with that animal is just I, I can't imagine not having that as part of that relationship um yeah. I know. It's, it's the most rewarding part. I had a trainer once who said, um, the more a horse likes you, the more it will do for you, which is maybe a little bit of a transactional way to think about the relationship. But it's also true, you know, if you're galloping down to a four foot table on cross country, you want your horse to like you in that moment, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, or doing anything out on a trail and come across something spooky, you know, you want, you always want to be on the same side as your horse. And I think that's easier when the horse knows that you show up for them, you know, to scratch their itchy spots and give them carrots and pose their leg if they have a swelling and just be there. Yeah, yeah it's a, it ends up being not like what you were talking about, Jess, not just a, an issue of um, young people being capable and, com and contributing to our community. By the way, this is another hit for people to actually watch the YouTube videos because yes. we get to see Jess's adorable cat <laughs> right yes, now who's taking up the majority of the screen and it's quite delightful. One of my three cats. She's mad at me because my we I have a kitten that I found on a wood pile like right when this coronavirus thing started and this cat has adopted that kitten. That Aww. kitten is locked in the bathroom right now because she got spayed a couple days ago and they will not stop roughhousing and I'm like she's gonna rip that incision open. So Hermione is I think trying to tell me right now that she'll get out of my face if I give her her kitten back. That's <laughs> <laughs> Hermione is holding Jess hostage right now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, um, she wants the mic. <laughs> yes, yeah, uh, so I'm sorry. What were you saying? Oh goodness! Please, you know what? I'm always happy to be distracted by animals. That is just fine. <laughs> I will find. I will find my my uh, story again here. Let's see. Oh yeah. Um, it's not just a, a, an issue of people, of kids growing up and being capable and contributing to yeah. the equine society in a, in a really positive way and working hard. It also ends up being a welfare issue because if we don't learn all of these other pieces, then we can't be there for our horses either. And that, you know, you might mm -hmm. miss something important if you don't know how your horse's leg is supposed to feel or if you don't groom your own right. horse. Yeah. Right. A friend of mine, um, was at a hunter barn, visiting a hunter barn a few weeks ago, and it was very, very nice, you know, top of the line hunter barn. And she was observing that, you know, the, the riders would come and get on the horse, you know, that was handed to them, tacked up, and, that, and the horse would be perfectly pleasant, and they would have a perfectly pleasant ride. But then when the rider got off, the horse's ears would go toward the groom, and it would look for the groom who was coming to collect it, because it was the groom who hosed it off, and the groom that gave it cookies. And that broke my heart, because if I'm jealous. If my horse looked at anybody else like that, I would be really sad, <laughs> you know? So it's, the relationship is built on the ground. It's very true. Now, I would love to talk, because I'm guessing that Pony Club probably is what led you into eventing, and you're doing a lot in the eventing yeah. world right now as well, hey? Yeah, so to the extent that anybody is doing anything in the eventing world, um, <laughs> We're all on hold. I actually took last year off of competing because I had a traumatic brain injury. I can't remember if I told you that part or like my oh. crazy convoluted story. Yeah. So I got a really bad concussion last year. I spent all of it like last February. So it was my whole year was like trashed. And I spent the whole year kind of learning how to find the jumps again. And that's just been really hard. So I didn't, I took my event horse to a couple of like show jumping, schooling shows, but I did not feel like I should be out there trying to find solid obstacles at a gallop when I 
could hardly like see, feel where I was. So I took last year off and now it looks like I'm probably going to take it most of this year off and that's very sad. But, um, what I'm decided what we're doing, what I'm doing with Aventures right now is this clinics for a cause program. Do you want me to tell you more about that? Yes, please. Okay. Segway. So I'm sorry. That was a perfect segue. <laughs> oh, good. So, you know, it's not just eventing that is sat down for, you know, at least the next month. And I'm guessing probably more. I mean, I'm probably not going to get back out there until it really, really feels safe. Um, so I was on the phone with my friend, Alice Bruno, who owns Shenandoah Sport Horses and which is also in Virginia and she's a genius. And we were like, we got to do something. This coronavirus is impacting us. It's impacting our friends. You know, every business you can think of in the horse world is having an issue right now that the trainers are, don't have lessons to teach. I don't have clinics to go to. The saddle fitters appointments have all been canceled. The tax stores are closed. A lot of them can't mail things that they want to mail to their clients. So even mail orders slowed down, you know, horse show managers, horse show photographers, braiders, shippers, you name it. It's all struggling. And those are, you know, Alice and I, like just about all of our friends are in that world. So we're like, what can we do? And we thought maybe we'd run an online horse show, but that didn't seem like the best idea because other people were kind of already doing it and we couldn't quite figure out how to do it better. So I, we decided that we should do it as a clinic instead. And I called my friend Sissy Wicks, who is a USEF large R hunter judge in the US. Do you guys have hunters in Canada, by the way? Or is that just a US thing? You have some hunters in Canada, right? Or is it mostly just jumpers? Yeah, yeah we've got you hunters do? in Canada, yeah. I, I figured it was like a North American thing, but I'm not, I wasn't sure how much. Um, so she's a hunter judge and she is like me. Like if she doesn't have a million projects to do at a time, she's climbing the walls trying to find stuff to do. <laughs> so I was like, I have a project for you. If you're bored, I can help. So with her help, we formulated clinics for a cause. And essentially the way it works is we have top trainers across all disciplines. I'll get back to them in a second because there's a lot of really cool people involved. And you just go onto our website, onlineridercollective.com, and you read about the trainers and you pick the one you want. It can be just about any discipline you can think of. We've got someone. And you upload a video and pay a small fee, which the proceeds of go towards the Equestrian Aid Foundation's COVID Relief Fund. And I'll get back to EAF in a second too, because they're amazing. So we send the video off to the clinician that you chose, and then they send back an audio recording of their commentary that they recorded while they watched the video. I edit those two things together and I send it back to the rider and they have a riding lesson on their computer from someone that they might not ever get to ride with. You know, you can't just trail her into Laura Kraut's barn. She's in England and it's probably impossible to get a lesson with her, right? But now you can. So that's exciting. Right now the price is $25. It's going to have to go up because we greatly underestimated how expensive it was to start this, but we think we're just going to raise it to like $40. So still keeping it affordable, but just a little bit to defray the very expensive cost of hosting this website. So we decided to partner with the Equestrian Aid Foundation, which is an organization that has been around since 1996. And it got started back then by a guy named Scott Evans, who's a good friend of mine. He still runs it. And Scott was observing that the equestrian world, even in the 90s, was still really, really suffering under the AIDS pandemic. And so he started, he called it the Equestrian AIDS Foundation at the time. And once it became more managed and maybe required a little bit less grassroots community care to help with the AIDS pandemic, he just renamed it the Equestrian Aid Foundation and has continued ever since to provide support for equestrians in need. So whether you have a catastrophic fall and can't work or your area has a huge fire and all of the hay is burned down or everybody needs to evacuate, Scott's organization is there to help. So I knew before I even asked him, I knew he was going to do a COVID relief fund because it just is what he does. So Sissy and Alice and I got on the phone with Scott. I told him what we were planning and he was very excited. I mean, any donations you can get when you're a nonprofit are great. So he really helped us out with the formulating how it would all work and coming up with some of the language around it. So the Equestrian Aid Foundation has been fabulous. I think as of a few days ago, as we're recording this, he said 
that he had given out $160, $500 grants to professionals in the equestrian industry. So not just trainers, but also people who own those other kinds of businesses I talked about before. And then yesterday, which was May 1st, as we're recording, um, we had been running Clinics for a Cause for two weeks, which is sort of a soft open period. You know, we tried to strike the line between hitting the ground running and not overwhelming ourselves. So just in that soft open period, we were able to donate in two weeks $785, which is about one and a half grants. So we're excited that in just two weeks we were able to do that. So I'm looking forward to seeing what we can do going forward. None of this would be happening if Sissy Wicks was not involved because she called everybody she knows, which is a lot of people, and said, I need your help. And so she's a hunter person, and so she got us other hunter luminaries like Louis Sirio, Don Stewart, who else? Um, Leslie Steele, oh gosh, Tom Wright, like a ton of Val Renahan, Sandy Farrell, I mean, just really great names in the hunter world. And she also just happens to live next door to Boyd Martin and Silva Martin. So Boyd and Silva Martin came on board right away. Philip Dutton followed suit because he and Boyd do everything together, I think. Um, we got Liz Halliday Sharp. We got Jenny Brannigan. We've got a lot of really great adventures too. So adventures, I kind of felt like I could reach out to them because I'm like, hey, I'm an adventure. I'm not as cool as you. I'm not writing at that level, but I'm an adventure and I need help. But the hundred people, I'm like, I don't know. They don't know me. I don't know them. So that was a, that was a a really remarkable start. And then something even more amazing happened, which was that people started to reach out to us to ask if they could help. So Laura Kraut and Norman Della Joyo, like the first day we launched, were like, hey, we'll, we would love to help you with this. And that just, I just could not believe that I was involved in something that they heard about and wanted to get involved in. And so they have been incredibly generous with their time because once people hear names like that, that's who they want to send all their videos to. So they've been super wonderful. And we also have a bunch of dressage people. We have Lauren Spreiser. We have Shannon Duick. We have Hillary Moore Hebert. I know I'm forgetting some really important people. Silva Martin, I mentioned. London Gray, who was like big time famous when I was a kid and is still out there doing a lot of great stuff with her dressage for kids organization. Um, we have Felicia Chandler. We have Lauren Fisher, Emily Goldstein. Just a lot of really great people. But those are the only three, like, sort of worlds I know about, right? I a little bit know hunter jumpers, and then I'm pretty comfortable with dressage and eventing. But I was like, but I think a lot of people in the U.S. ride Western, and I don't know anything about that, and I don't know who's cool. So then I started asking around and getting recommendations for people for reining and Western dressage and breed-specific trainers and natural horsemanship people and, you know, you name it. We were – they're coming in. So we're – working really hard to reach the world that Alice and Sissy and I are not directly involved in. And so if anybody listening or watching this is like, I know a trainer you should reach out to and a discipline you don't already have, please, please email me at onlinewriterscollective at gmail.com because I will reach out to them same day and get them involved. We, we want more representation of disciplines that aren't already overrepresented on the site. That's amazing. Um, um, what a I'm getting goosebumps <laughs> like he like <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, so for people listening if they're like hey i just started with horses and i have only learned how to walk and trot and stop and go but i really want yeah. to support this cause are there can i still get a lesson from a fancy person like who is this for it's for everybody i'm so glad you asked that so we've had um yesterday i edited two videos on opposite ends of the spectrum, right? So my friend JJ Lavieri, who is one of our Clinics for a Cause jumper trainers and is a great friend of mine, um, he's had videos submitted to him, but then he sent in a video to Laura Kraut to do. So then I edited a Grand Prix rider getting feedback from another Grand Prix rider, which is like amazing to watch. But the other video I edited yesterday, and this is what gave me like, like all of the best feelings, is a person, an adult beginner who is sort of clearly kind of just getting comfortable like cantering and jumping little tiny jumps, sent in a video for Boyd Martin. And I loved it. She did such a nice job. She clearly really put the time into like cleaning up her horse. He looked wonderful. She coordinated like her shirt and the horse's saddle pad and polished her boots and I was just like I mean like in the first two seconds I was like oh my god I love this woman right and Boyd 
listened, you know, to the, we, there's like a notes you can send to the clinicians. So you can kind of tell them like who you are and what you're doing and what you need help with. And so he clearly was responding to that, to the things that she said she needed. And, you know, here's this guy who's like won Olympic medals, like giving this writer who's just starting out incredible, like mental images for how to post better, um, good ways. She had, she's riding this adorable, like drafty horse who is clearly like, this is as fast as I go and I don't go any faster. And he's like, <laughs> he could go faster. Here are some things you could try to like get him to sort of pick up his feet. And I'm like, I like wanted to cry. I was like, this is what this is about, right? Like she's probably not at a phase of her career as a writer where she's going to haul for six hours and pay $900 to ride in a clinic with Boyd Martin where she'd just be one of seven people, but she paid $25 and got 15 minutes of her riding critiqued and really useful. But for riders who are like, oh my God, I am totally that person. I am that beginner. I am, but I'm like way too scared to send my videos to Boyd Martin. That's okay. We have a bunch of trainers who are outstanding, but who aren't huge names. So if you're too shy to send it to Boyd or to Laura Kraut or to Lauren Spreiser, um, check out some of the other writers, Felicia Chandler, Kathy Fredrickson, Alyssa Peterson. These are all people who have coached every level of writer. I have watched um, Alyssa Peterson stand in my ring and teach up-down lessons to beginners, and I have watched her like coach someone about to go intermediate. So there's, read through the bios, and if you're too intimidated for a big name, no problem. There are people there who really know what they're doing and are not going to be like, they're not going to feel at all weird about getting a video from someone who's kind of just figuring out how to hold the reins. And the other thing I will say is that for in every discipline at every level, I have heard riders say, or trainers say, shorten your reins. So that is something that spans all levels of riders. You know, put your leg on and shorten your reins. Like they're saying that to the beginners, they're saying it to the Grand Prix riders. I'm curious, um, cause I can, you know, speculate that another barrier for people would just be, you know, how to create that video. Are you just getting videos oh, yeah. on cell phones? Like what quality are you looking for in the videos that are submitted? We've had a really wide range of quality too. We've had cell phone videos where the phone is like held up in, you know, in like, like this. Try not to do that if somebody... <laughs> do this if you can, right? But if this is all you already have, it's fine. It's just a little bit harder to see. Um, so we've had everything from that, like the, the person is, you know, way across the ring holding the phone wrong to professional videos at big time horror shows. So it doesn't really matter as long as they can see, as long as they can see you clearly. And if you're sending in a jumping round, it helps if they can at least see most of the jumps. I mean, sometimes you're going to not get a great view of a jump because another jump is in the way. But the more they can see, the better. So I wouldn't necessarily worry if all you have is cell phone video. You can send in old video from shows. You can go take a new video today. You know, some people don't have access to their horse right now. So they're sending an older video. But it doesn't really matter. It's whatever you want. It, it can be a combination, too. So you can, most people have some way to edit video, either on their phone or their computer, like iMovie or something like that. So you can just stitch together clips if you'd like to. The videos, um, the time limit is 15 minutes because by the time all the editing is done and the clinician's done talking, it's usually about 20 minutes. And that is about as big a file as my like backwoods rural internet can handle sending you. So um, up to 15 minutes, but it doesn't have to be all 15 minutes from one ride. It doesn't even have to be the same horse. Um, I did a video earlier today of a woman riding four different horses I did a video yesterday of a woman who was riding the same horse, but it was like rounds that she selected over the course of a year. So you could kind of see like the progress she had made. Whatever you want to do, it's really, really fine. Just try to send in video that um, is not too blurry, not too shaky, if you can. It's so neat to think about, you know, one of the things that has been coming up a lot in conversations for me is just the sense of, you know, real isolation that people are feeling um, with with the pandemic that's happening. And it's so neat to think about just the expansiveness that you've created and the connections that you're creating in the community through this project. Um, and, you know, when I as a writer think of having access to all of those clinicians that you've just been talking about, I mean, that's something that, you know, I, I don't know if I ever would have had access to that in a different, in 
in, you know, just by hauling and trailering on a different platform, like so to say. So it's really, really. <laughs> Thanks. I'm excited about it too. And it's been so gratifying to wake up every day and see who sent in videos, you know, and who they've sent them to and getting them back and putting it together. And people are just really excited to get them. And we've also like two days ago, I think three days ago, maybe now we started a Facebook group called the online writers collective community. We have a page for the called online writers collective, but we also have a Facebook group and like, this morning we hit 2,000 members, which just happened like that. I was like stunned. So people want to connect right now. That's absolutely true. And they want to talk about horses and they want to talk about what it's going to be like when we can get back to horse showing because it's not going to be the same, especially in like Hunterland where you have like 17 people crowning by the gate, sitting on their horses waiting for their trip. It, that's just not going to work for a while. They're going to have to figure out a way to limit how many people are around. So those are the kinds of conversations that people want to be having and they seem to like having a space to do it and an opportunity to share their video a lot you know people are proud when they get these videos back because all the clinicians are super nice and they say nice things in addition to constructive things so they're like look Laura Kraut said she wanted to buy my horse boy oh. mom said that he admired what a good rider I am I mean yeah and they don't again like Boyd Martin said to a woman who submitted a really, really nice video of a novice eventing around, like, I am admiring what a good rider you are. And I think that's wonderful because she is a very, very good rider. And, but you would think you wouldn't hear that from someone like Boyd until you were like at his level, but no, he, he can see good riding at any level. And all the clinicians are like that. They're giving, they want, they want you to feel good when you watch the video, but they also want to help. So they've, they're all walking that line really, really well. Was there anything about this project that surprised you that you didn't quite anticipate going into it? I think how quickly it caught on and how, I think when we first envisioned it, it's so hard, this was like three weeks ago, but it feels like a different lifetime. I was like, okay, we'll get like one hunter judge or one hunter coach and one jumping coach and one eventing coach and one dressage coach. And that was like, I thought that would be great if we could do that, that would be really great. So the fact that we have so many so very many dozens at this point of coaches who wanted to participate. That is one of the things that shocked me the most. And then the other thing is that of all of the videos that have been submitted so far, I only know one of the people, maybe two, two of the people who've submitted them. And that also blows my mind because I'm like, again, connection, right? Like I'm also getting to meet people that I didn't know. Um, I am thrilled to death. I'm not surprised, but I'm very, very happy with how I've basically like Alice has to run her Instagram because I just, my brain just does not work the way hers does with Instagram. So I am really floored at what a terrific job she's doing on our Instagram stuff and the amazing ideas that she has and thrilled that people seem receptive to them. So we've been doing a lot of Instagram stories takeovers, like it's Saturday today. So we're doing small business Saturday and every Saturday we're letting a small business take over our Instagram stories. Aww. Um, which was a great idea of hers. And so we're having a lot of fun with that. And this past week was Hunter Week. So we let, you know, Hunter trainers take over our Instagram stories or go live with us on Instagram. And I'm loving how well Alice has coordinated all of that. And I'm surprised and pleased at how well these people, like the trainers themselves, are how much they're willing to do, right? So like Don Stewart, I don't know if you guys know him, but he's a really famous sort of hunter and equitation trainer down here and he coaches a lot a lot a lot of juniors and he called me like three times the first time I sent him a video to critique to be like wait I still don't understand how to do this I'm a, you know, he's like I'm a hundred years old and I don't know how to do this you're gonna have to walk me through it again and I'm like sure I can do that but so you know how many coaches of his generation are like okay I'll do Instagram live with you I don't know what Instagram is or what live means but if you tell me I'll do it because they just want to help I mean the trainers are getting nothing out of this other than like feeling good we're not paying them this is all volunteer all of the videos all of the promotion they're all doing it um just because they want to and I just and blown away by their generosity. Jess, I am just, it, it, this whole thing warms my heart throughout this. I'm like getting a little bit teary. I can feel like same. smiles. <laughs> um, it's, it, what a wonderful, um, what a wonderful story and what a cool community. Uh, amongst this 
kind of whirlwind because it sounds like this really cool thing has taken off. Um, have you managed to get your own video in there yet? Have you, uh, <laughs> you had a video looked at? I was just talking about that with my mom the other day. I was like, I'll send a video of you if you'll video me. I have sent in a couple of older videos. When we first got started, before we really opened for business, so to speak, I wanted to give people a finished product to look at. So I tracked down a couple really old videos that I had on my phone um, and sent them to a couple different trainers to critique so that people could see what they were going to get. Because I felt like it was a little hard to explain what it was. If if you're still having trouble picturing it, we have a YouTube channel for Online Writers Collective and we have a whole playlist of the Clinics for a Cause videos that people have given us permission to share. We don't share them if people don't say go for it because it's scary, but I don't care, <laughs> like whatever. So I found some old videos of like my baby horses doing baby stuff and sent those in, partly because I also wanted people to see that you don't have to be like jumping huge jumps. I mean, I think I sent in a video of like one of my horses doing a walk trot dressage test. So that was, and the feedback was terrific and useful to me even now. So I'm hoping this week, it's supposed to be nice here in Virginia. And I think that I can talk my mother into walking down to my ring and standing there with a the phone and filming me like trying to wrestle my thoroughbred into submission. <laughs> so hopefully I will do that. And when I do, I will share it so everybody can see uh, what what happens, you know, on this side of the screen where I'm not just sitting around editing videos all the time. That's so cool. Well, let us know how that goes and when you get feedback and if you're, you know, because that would be fun. We'd, we'd love to share that on, on our oh, Facebook yeah. page or we could have a conversation about sure. it to kind of yeah. help, help promote the process and people can learn what it's really all about. Yeah, I will definitely do that. And, you know, anybody that wants to can hop on that Clinics for a Cause playlist on the Online Writers Collective YouTube channel too and just just take a look. There's I There are a few videos that people have given me permission to share that I just haven't gotten around to uploading yet. But like the woman that I was saying, the adult beginner with, that took the lesson from Boyd gave me permission to share it. And I was so excited. That was the one I was like, I really want people to see this. So that will be up there hopefully by the time this podcast comes out, if I've had time to do it. Um, but yeah, whenever I get new videos in, I will definitely send them your way. Everybody can watch and, you know, tell me that I need to shorten my reins and put my leg on too, just like everybody else does. Um, I'm just thinking back. So um, for those of you who aren't watching the podcast on YouTube, um, Jess had some really good feedback. Um, holding your phone instead of vertically, horizontally, um, trying to yes. get as much in the shot as you can. Um, are you also just getting a lot of videos? Like, do you have to have an arena to submit a video? Can you just do it in your field? Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, if you're on, if you if there's a horse in the video, send it in, right? <laughs> Even if you're not on the horse, it's fine. I'm sure the natural horsemanship people have a lot to say. Or if you're like, I don't feel like I know how to get on, right? Send that in. It's fine. Um, no, there's no real requirements. The only videos I would think, and I can't imagine that we would get these, is if somebody was being abusive to their horse in the video. But that, I certainly haven't seen that. I don't imagine we would get it. I think that's the only thing I would be like, no, I don't really want to put the clinicians in the place to have to kind of deal with that over a video. So otherwise, if you have a horse and you want somebody to look at it, send a video in. You can send a video lunging. If you're like, I'm trying, lunging is a big part of the Pony Club certifications mm -hmm. for one thing. And if you're like, I need to learn how to lunge better. I don't really know what I'm doing. Send that video in, you know, whatever it takes, whatever you are working on. I'm also working on getting a saddle fitter um, who is going to give like evaluations of your horse's back through photos. And we have... The Liv Grood, who runs Pro Equine Grooms, which is a really big blog for, you know, all kinds of grooming stuff, she is one of our clinicians too. So if you're like, this is my horse and this is, you know, our horse show turnout and we didn't score very well in the hunter ring or, you know, my pony club examiner said that my horse needed to be better turned out, but I don't really know what to do, send in pictures and videos of that. It doesn't have to be a riding critique. We do confirmation critiques. So if you're like, I have this three-year-old, or I or I just bought this horse, and I wanted to know if you thought he'd be suitable for Western dressage, we can do that too. We have all that. So you don't even have to be writing in the videos to get a good critique. 
Wow, so just really sounds like you're taking down lots of barriers and just really trying to get as much information out there as possible, which is so, so cool. I'm, I'm glad. And, you know, if somebody comes across a barrier or perceives one and it's like, I don't know if I can do this, just, you know, slide into my DMs or shoot me an email and I will figure out a way to make it work for you. It's not a huge deal. Now, we usually do all of our... Um promo stuff at the end of the podcast, but this actually <laughs> could be a good opportunity. So um, uh, where do they find Clinics for a Cause and the Online Riders Collective, right? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yes. And, uh, and my brain is slow this morning. Um, and, <laughs> uh, and Instagram, Facebook, like give us all the how people can, can find your, your cause here. Great. So our website is just onlineridercollective.com. It's easy. Um, you can find our YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram from there, but those are all just at Online Writers Collective. Um, yeah, it's just facebook.com slash onlineridercollective. It's right there. Or if you want to join the Facebook group, it's facebook.com slash ORC community and just send in a request and we'll add you. Perfect. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah. And if anybody has a small business and they would like to take advantage of Small Business Saturday and do an Instagram stories takeover, um, again, just follow us on Instagram and send us a DM there and we'll get you scheduled in. We're already, we announced that program this morning and we're already scheduling into June, which is fun and exciting. Um, so it might take a little while, but if somebody wants, you know, if they really have something they need to promote, like sooner than that, if they're doing a big sale or something, like we just want to help. So let us know how, and we will help figure it out. And if you're running a nonprofit that's struggling right now, reach out to us too, and we'll see what we can do to help out, at least promote your nonprofit and try to drive some donations your way. Are you, amongst all of this, because this sounds like it's probably taking a lot of time, um, yeah. I mean, it looks like it looks like it's a heart project and heart projects when they take a lot of time. It's not that bad. But um, are you still finding time for your own riding? I know you said that you were um, uh, there was some head injury recovery that was limiting some things as well. Are you still getting on horses right now? Yep, I am riding at least two horses a day. So I have um, my mom and I between the two of us, we share a barn. We have seven horses. So I, one of them is my event horse and I ride him just about every day because if I don't, he's kind of a monster, but I'm being extra careful no matter what horse I get on right now, not just because of my head injury, but because I don't want to be a burden on the healthcare system, even though there's no like hospital bed shortage in the area where I live. But even so, I'm cognizant of that. So I'm only riding on the flat right now. I'm not jumping anybody. Um, I obviously am wearing a helmet every time I ride, but like I'm a pony clubber. I do that anyway. I'm wearing my cross-country vest every time I get on, and I went out and bought a pair of safety stirrups for adults that will, that, so I won't get dragged if I do come off. So I'm taking extra safety measures. I'm not getting on if it's like super duper windy or something, and it just seems like I'm going to be dealing with crazy spooky horses. But yes, I ride my event horse just about every day. He's just an easier horse to be around if I do. And then I also have a dressage horse who I know that I said like I love thoroughbreds and everything, but my dressage horse is actually like this gigantic draft cross, but she's really hot and really forward. So it's okay. I don't have to kick her. It works. <laughs> so I try to ride her a bunch too because she also like kind of gets like, Ugh. if I don't ride her, she'll forget everything she knows. So I'm trying to keep them in work. And then my mom is a doctor actually. So she's having a lot less time to ride right now. So I'm keeping her, um, I was keeping her event horse and work for her, but then he got an injury. So he's out for like a couple weeks. He'll be okay. And so she's been riding my retired upper level horse and he has been a blast. So now that she's kind of been riding him more, I'm trying to ride him when she can't just because he's like 25 and I feel like you can't like give them a break and then get on them and give them a break and get on them when they're 25. So I've been riding a lot actually. Yeah. I don't sleep but I get all the writing in. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like you don't sleep between everything you've got going on. Um, I don't think adventures sleep. I think it's a, I don't think it's a thing we do. I think we like just <laughs> drink too much coffee and then at some point switch to wine and that's how we live our lives. <laughs> um, tell us more about your, um, 
uh, your, I, I believe you said you've got your draft cross and then kind of uh -huh. your, your off the track thoroughbreds and you've got uh -huh. some goals for these guys. Where are you hoping to take them? So I would, my, my dressage horse, um, she's kind of an interesting story, actually. I think she just turned seven. I'm a professional historian, but I'm really, really bad at dates. And that's been true since before the TBI. Like, that doesn't have anything to do with it. I've just always been bad at remembering what year things happened or how long it's been. It's just not how my brain works. So I think she just turned seven. She's a little green for a seven-year-old, but that's okay. But I've, we've actually had her um, since she was born. My mom bought a horse, I guess, eight years ago who turned out to be pregnant and turned out, and that horse was not a draft horse. I don't know what she was. Nobody does. We don't also know what the dad is, but this filly came out with like knees like this, like, oh. like the size of my head and feathers oh. just everywhere. So, so it's like, okay, well dad is a draft horse. That's all we got. So she's big, she's this big black and white thing. And she was meant to be my mom's horse. So we kind of had her started by like a really good, you know, baby starting farm a few hours south of us and they did a wonderful job with her and I'm like I guess I've a little bit let that go because she's kind of got an attitude now um but she's just really really big and kind of bossy and kind of sassy and like I really like that edge in a horse and my mom kind of just wants like a puppy dog because fair enough you know like she deserves a puppy dog at this stage of her life so I took back the ride on that mare last year and was like, this is a dressage horse. That's what she will do. Um, she jumps a little bit here and there. She really likes it, but she's so big and so heavy that I'm like, I think I'm going to break her if I jump her a lot. And then my mom bought herself an, another off the track thoroughbred and actually much greener off the track thoroughbred than I have. He came off the track last February after at 10 years old, after 94 starts and wow. he's quiet. He's, I would put a kid on him. He's just like, whatever. He just like wanders around you have to kick him a little bit. So, um, so I kind of was like, buy that one and give me back the mare. So I would <laughs> like to get my, <laughs> I would like to get my bronze medal, my USDF bronze medal with my mare. I don't know. Again, I don't really know how the Canadian like dressage like levels work, but that's like third level. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that the same? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Same. Yeah, so you have to show, like, you know, a certain level of competency at third level, which I think this mare should be able to do. She's actually a nicer horse than, if you just saw her standing around, you'd be like, whatever. But when she starts moving, you're like, oh, wait, she actually has some, like, suspension and she has some drive. So we'll see. I mean, that's my goal for her. And I don't care how long it takes. Like, this mare's never, ever, ever getting sold. So it can take another 10 years. It really doesn't matter. And then my my off the track thoroughbred Mo, who's like my heart horse. When I eventually get around to sending you a picture for this, I'll try to do that as soon as we're done. The horse in the picture will certainly be Mo. He's this gorgeous, <laughs> like dark, dark bay thoroughbred. He's got like a cute little blaze and he's so bad that nobody will ride him except me. So <laughs> I'm stuck with him. <laughs> Can't sell Mo. Um, it took me, I've had him for like five years and I think this Within the last 12 months, I have been able to get on him at the mounting block without, like, him running off or bucking or spinning away from me or whatever. Like, he's just that guy. He's quirky and weird. But I, I feel safe on him. He jumps whatever is put in front of him. He's careful. He's scopy. He's so good. So I would like to do – they just changed the star, you know, the FEI star systems. But I would like to do a two-star with him. My previous goal had been a one-star. It's the same goal. It just sounds fancier now that it's a two-star because it's basically a hard preliminary. So that's what I'd like to do with him. I used to think that, you know, maybe I would go all the way with that horse, but now I just don't really want to. It doesn't have anything to do with him. It's just me. I'm like, I, two-star sounds like a great goal. Good enough. Good enough to have fun. I'm too chicken anymore to go advanced. I've gotten too old. So uh, yeah, so those are my goals for those two. And then I would love to see my mom, you know, go have fun at novice with her adorable little off the track guy too. Um, I'm curious just cause, you know, I think it's something we all kind of think about too, kind of going through this time. Um, it's such an amazing, um, opportunity to kind of look at doing things differently even you know once we are out of you know the COVID time and you know mm -hmm. do you have a sense if you'll continue um to have clinics online um even you know 
after we're kind of through this this time? I certainly hope so. I, I, I'm, you know, that it might look different, but I hope that we can kind of keep doing it the way we've been doing it. The, there are a couple of reasons why. One is that there's always going to be something that, you know, we need to raise money for, whether it's a hay shortage or like the wildfires or whatever. I mean, equestrians always need help. So we can keep raising money for the Equestrian Aid Foundation forever, as far as I'm concerned. Um, the other thing is that, you know, for $25 to be able to get 50 minutes of your ride evaluated by you know like a top professional you might not even it might not even be in your country I think that's going to be an opportunity people still want to take advantage of and not just to get you know that that sort of out of reach person to to watch your ride but also because you know it's expensive to haul places um, some people live in really remote areas and it's hard to get out to a clinic anywhere at any time of year and you like I have friends who event in Idaho that's like in the middle of nowhere and they just have to wait till somebody shows up out there because otherwise they would have to drive for two days to get to a place that was going to have a clinic and for working until the amateurs that's not going to happen so for that reason you know the accessibility factor I think is really big um also you know I just heard from a mom this morning who said that she sent her daughter's videos to the NCEA, the National Collegiate Equestrian Association recruiters, as part of her recruitment package. I had not even thought of that. That's brilliant. That will always need to be there. This is a great way to do it. Um, my business partner, Alice, who sells horses, is like, I'm going to put every sales horse I have through this because you get someone fancy saying something nice about the horse that you know adds to their value. And then I was thinking too when I was writing yesterday and Mo was being naughty, I'm like, you never do this in a lesson. Why don't you do this in a lesson when somebody can tell me what to do? So I'm like, oh wait, if I just got someone to video him doing this thing he does to me at home all the time, and then I sent it to a coach, I can be like, this is the thing I've been whining about that you've never seen him do. And then they can give me feedback. So yeah. I think it addresses a lot of those pain points that writers have, even when we're not dealing with everything being closed and horse shows not happening. So I'm hoping that the, our professionals can still find the time to evaluate the videos even after this, but I'm confident that we will keep running this for as long as people want to do it because we're having a great time. Um, I'm going to take kind of like a, a left turn here. So this is going to sound <laughs> a little bit like, like it, uh, like it doesn't flow very well, but I swear that's how my brain works. Um, <laughs> is so you've done you've done uh, some wonderful, wonderful things now for the equine business community, and you've got a big heart. Obviously, you like to take on these challenging horses and and these off the track <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, is your your. You're a cool person, Jess, first off, I will oh, say. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, now, I also wanted to touch on uh, your contributions to the um, queer equine community. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, I read an, one of your articles because I, I think Mira mentioned in your intro that you're also um, a freelance writer, right? Mm -hmm. um, and one of the articles, there was a question in there that I apologize, I am stealing their question. Um, you've probably been <laughs> asked it before, but I thought it was an important question to, to bring up. Um, how, can, how can the horse world um, do a better job of making, um, uh, making the community feel more comfortable and safe for the queer community? So I don't, I remember that interview, but I don't remember how I answered that question. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'll say this now in, you know, whatever experiences I've had since then. The first thing I would say, the number one thing I would say is don't tell us queer people that there is no problem with homophobia in the horse community. Mm -hmm. That has been something that has come up for me a lot over the past several months where people are like, no, that's just not a problem. It, I've never seen it. I know a gay trainer my best friend's son is gay and he's riding, like that doesn't mean that there's no homophobia, right? And so a lot of times when people belong to a privileged community, you know, or a, however you want to think about that, right? So whether, you, whether it's straight privilege or white privilege or, you know, privilege surrounding wealth or religious or whatever other identity you have, you don't 
always see what is happening to and in communities that are more marginalized. But that doesn't mean that it isn't happening. And so I remember having a big, long, protracted, horrible internet fight on Facebook comments, like around the first of the year, of people saying, not saying homophobic things, but saying, you're wrong, there's no homophobia. And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so that would be the first thing I would say, because I think that's one of the most frustrating things that I come across is people just denying that it's a problem. It's a problem whether you want to believe it is or not, and whether you see it or not. So that's the first thing I would say is whatever else you do, if you can't think of any other way to be supportive, just listen with compassion to what people are telling you. So if they're saying, I, you know, I had this problem with my barn manager or someone at the horse show said something weird to me, or I just feel like whenever I walk into a group, everybody kind of stops talking, you know, whatever it is, don't tell them, oh, I'm sure they didn't mean it that way. Or I don't think that's what happened. Like that's pretty harsh actually to do to somebody. So I would just listen and ask questions like, oh, you know, how, how did you feel when that happened? And oh, now my dog is walking over. I don't know if you can hear him. Um, <laughs> you know, how, how did you feel when that happened? Is there anything you would like me to do? Um, those sorts of questions. If you, jumping right into defending the people who, you know, did perceived harm to someone else in general, whether that person is queer or a person of color or whatever, um, that's not always helpful. So, you know, my barn manager said that she was afraid I was going to, you know, hit on all the lesson moms. That's actually something that somebody said about me once. It like blew my mind. I was like, I've never hit on anybody in my life. I'm the most awkward person anybody has ever met. Um, but then, you know, a bunch of people saying, well, I'm sure that's not really what she meant, or I don't really think she said that. Like, no, she said it. I was there and you weren't, right? So don't gaslight people, I guess would be my number one thing. Just listen and be supportive. And then I would say that setting a good example for things like using somebody's pronouns, um, not addressing a group of equestrians as ladies. I feel like that happens a lot in Facebook groups I'm in. People just assume that everybody that rides or everybody in the group is a woman. So they're like, hey ladies. And I'm like, hi, not a lady actually. And that really flows in there like, oh, a man is in this group? Well, no, <laughs> right? And I don't wanna necessarily want to spend my time in like a group about thoroughbreds, like trying to, you know, just don't, just try not to do that if you can, because it's not actually the case that everybody who rides is like a cis woman. Um, and I think just generally be mindful, you know, if, if, if you see that, you know, sometimes in some areas that I've lived, it's been really rough. You know, I was at a barn once where the farrier who came to that barn was really mean and nasty to queer people. And there were a few of us in the barn. Um, and it helped a lot when a straight person pointed that out to the barn manager uh, instead of us, right? It, the fact that she was like, okay, well, you know, I can see that this is a problem and it's a problem for me that he's being rotten to you. So I'm going to bring it up because I have, I don't think she phrased it this way, but she was saying, I kind of have the social capital to have this conversation. Whereas if one of us had gone to the barn manager, she might've just kind of been like, oh, you're being too sensitive and shut it down. So that's sort of off the top of my head, ways that I can think of that people can be helpful. I also really love it. I so I buy like bulk rainbow flags, like just the little ones that you would just like hold and wave at a pride parade. And I sew them onto my saddle pads when I go to horse shows, which I get a ton of compliments on. So do that too. Say, oh my God, I love your rainbow saddle flag. Everybody knows what the rainbow saddle pad. Everybody knows what the rainbow is, what the rainbow flag is at this point. And so when people say, I love that, it just sort of makes me feel good. So when you notice somebody being openly like queer, give them a thumbs up. It, it's, it goes a long way. What great answers. Oh, thanks. I felt like I was <laughs> rambling. <laughs> yeah, no, no, you, you, it was really directed rambling. It worked well. Um, oh, good. Okay. <laughs> I'm curious where one can buy some of those um, uh, rainbow flag things you can stitch onto your, yeah. Um, I will cop to the fact that I probably, I mean, I've had like a pack of a hundred of them for like two years now and I probably got them on Amazon or something horrible like that. But I'm sure that there are small businesses just waiting to sell you small rainbow flags that you can sew onto your saddle pads and they'll probably be higher quality. Um, you could get creative too. I mean, you could paint it on there with fabric paint if you wanted to. I like that. I like to kind of crafty and, you know, 
another sort of gay stereotype, but I like to do stuff like that. So, you know, you could, you could paint it on, you could sew on a flag. It takes two seconds. You don't even need a sewing machine. You could iron, you could get that like fabric adhesive that you just iron on. That would also work. Yeah, it's, it's a neat topic um, to bring up and to kind of discuss. And I think just a really important, um, you know, piece to have out there too, just to raise awareness. Um, Cause I say, I think sometimes that's, you know, really the most important part is to start, you know, really just kind of changing people's perspectives, just like you were saying, just around perceiving things a little bit differently and, um, you know, maybe calling into question their own actions next time something comes up yeah. in that way. And so creating change in those ways. So I appreciate yeah. speaking to that. Um, I'm just wanting to loop back to some of your freelance writing. I'm guessing with this big passion project that you have going on, that's probably <laughs> not happening too much right now, but um, you are quite um, an avid freelance writer is my understanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I have some ongoing freelance clients that I've been working with for a while. Um, most of them at this particular moment are outside the horse world. So I, like I write for an, a finance company, like I don't know anything about finance, but they tell me what they want <laughs> said and then I just find a pretty way to say it. So I have regular um, work coming in that I do. And then I also just got hired to write a bunch of like lead magnets, which is great fun. So I'm doing, it's actually useful for me to be writing about something that's not in the horse world right now. Um, freelance writing is hard to break into. You kind of have to start out knowing, for me, I couldn't find a way in until I kind of made the right connections with people who had writing they needed to, they needed done and were willing to give me a chance to do it. So that's been paying the bills to the extent that the bills are getting paid, which is not as much as they need to be right now. Um, I also actually write a lot for Horse Network, which is a really, really great um, horse website that's based out of the U.S. Um, I think they're based out of Wellington, so they're kind of right in the middle of horse country. And they post all kinds of stuff across disciplines too, and they've been a supporter of clinics for a cause, so I'd love to shout them out. But um, freelance writing in the horse world is tricky. If you want to be a freelance writer, you are l likely looking at making a lot less money than you would writing for publications that are not horse related. Or in my case, a lot of what I write isn't for publication. It's web copy or ad copy, or um, like I said, lead magnets for websites and stuff. So that is more lucrative than writing for horse publications. But writing for horse publications is fun. And so I make the time to do it even if it doesn't pay as much because, you know, obviously all I ever want to think or talk about is horses. So. <laughs> Are there any topics that you're asked to write about that you particularly kind of resonate with or that are kind of closer to your heart? Um, I've written a lot about mental health elements. Not for, I'm not a therapist or anything, but just sort of from the perspective of someone who's, you know, like a lot of us kind of dealt with depression and anxiety. I think that's incredibly common everywhere, but, you know, in the horse community too. So I, I feel like I get asked to write about that a fair amount um, from the perspective of someone who deals with it. So ways that I've dealt with anxiety at the barn or how to manage seasonal depression as an equestrian. I've been asked by various publications to write things about being a queer horse person. I'm worried that I'm going to run out of things to say about that in writing because <laughs> I don't want to send the same article to everybody. Um, but if somebody really wants me to write about that, I will write about it. I just need a minute to kind of think about how to say it in a new way, I suppose. Um, and right now, I mean, if you want to write about how the horse world is dealing with coronavirus, you can probably write as much as you want. I, for a while, was selling almost like a post a day to a horse magazine on coronavirus stuff. And then I got too busy with this clinics for a cause to keep writing at that low speed, especially around my other freelance work. So that's what I do. And then, um, or sometimes a company, again, this isn't for publication, but if a, an organization wants to send out an email through like a big listserv or something, they'll ask me to write or design that email, which I'm always happy to do. Mm -hmm. And so anybody who wants to get into freelance writing, you this is advice that nobody asked me for, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. Learn how to use every email platform there is, MailChimp, Constant Contact, MailerLite, all of those, and get really comfortable with designing in them because that goes a long way. People want to know that you can do that. And then just practice copywriting for ad, like advertising copywriting all day. And even if it nobody buys it, you can still you know, put it in your portfolio as spec work because 
that is what pays the bills is stuff that might seem boring, but it has to get done. Nobody else wants to do it. If you can do it and do it well, then, you know, you should be able to keep your horse in shoes. <laughs> and hay in the barn. <laughs> hay in the barn. Oh, man. That's a big one right now for sure. Yeah. Um, is there anything just that, um, that you'd like to spend a little bit more time talking about or anything big that and important to you that we didn't touch on that you would like to, to, um, get out there in the podcast? I think that we have just about covered everything I can think of. I would just like to, again, you know, say that if there's a, a equestrian industry that's important to you, this is a great time to find a way to support it. Um, whether, you know, you just buy whatever it is that you need from a small business and deal with it taking a little longer to ship. Um, if you have the disposable income to do so, consider making a donation to the nonprofits in your area, um, equestrian or not. But I know, for instance, I'm good friends with some of the folks at a therapeutic riding center called Gallup NYC. And they're like, really worried about how they're going to keep the doors open. So, you know, if you have, if you can help, there's a lot of, there are a lot of ways to do it, whether you can, you know, maybe donate a little bit of your stimulus check to a nonprofit, or if you can't do those things, you know, learn how to make masks and send them to people. I mean, there's so many ways people can help right now. And, you know, if there's, if you want to volunteer for clinics for a cause, even if you're not a trainer, but you know how to edit video, please email me. I will take you up on that. Like, there are ways you can help. And, um, and I guess that's the last thing that I would want to put out there is, you know, figure out what that is for you. And if you can't figure it out, email me and I will help you figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> what a wonderful podcast and what a nice um, break from all the heaviness of this whole pandemic. Um, it's really, um, I don't know, like uh, the topic feels really light and hopeful and inspirational. Okay. So yeah, thank you so much. Mira, do you have anything else that you want to add? Oh, I think you captured it, Emma, but I was just sitting here, <laughs> but, you know, it's been such a trying time for everyone and it's so incredible to hear some of the innovation that's coming out of that. And I just, I really appreciate you just taking the time and reaching out to us to be able to support um, this cause, getting out there and, and hopefully you know, getting, getting some more lessons coming your way to forward yep. on clinicians and just really, really happy that you reached out and that we were able to support you. Yes, thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun and I'm just really honored that you thought that, you know, Clinics for a Cause is something that you wanted to talk about. So this has been a great time. <laughs> Great. Okay. Mira, is that a wrap? I think that's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs> if you want more Friends on Horses, you can find us on Facebook at Friends on Horses Podcast. Check it out for all the latest and greatest horsey news. You can find us on the web at Friends on Horses Podcast.com or Instagram at Friends on Horses underscore podcast. Like what you hear? Help us quit our hay jobs by supporting Friends on Horses. You can support us by rating our episodes on iTunes becoming an ongoing sponsor through Patreon, or simply by spreading the word about our show. Have some feedback? We'd love to hear from you. Contact us via email at friendsonhorses at gmail.com. Thanks for joining us. Until next time. <laughs>